Good evening. My name is Herman Beavers, and I'm Professor of English and Africana Studies here at the University of Pennsylvania. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our 2021 Brave Testimony Poetry Reading. Uh, held each year during National Poetry Month, Brave Testimony was inaugurated in the year 2000 as an annual event to celebrate the poetry of the African diaspora. We are delighted to welcome this year Era D. Matthews for this year's program. Before I move into the introduction, I just want to acknowledge and thank our co-sponsors, the Kelly Writers House and the Annenberg School of Communication uh, for their annual support of this program. Also, following the reading, uh, we will have time for Professor Matthews um, to answer questions from the audience. So please type your questions in the Q&A box at any time during her reading. And now it's my honor to introduce Era D. Matthews. Era D. Matthews' first collection of poems is the critically acclaimed Simulacra, which received the prestigious 2016 Yale Series of Younger Poets Award. The collection explores the topics of want and desire with power, insight, and intense emotion. Professor Matthews has received the 2016 Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, and she was also awarded the Louis Untermeyer Scholarship in Poetry from the 2016 Breadloaf Writers Conference. Um, she's a founding member of the Riven Collective, along with Marissa Johnson Valenzuela and Cynthia Dewey Oka. Her work has appeared in Best American Poets 2015, American Poets, The Rumpus, Four-Way Four Review, Indiana Review, and elsewhere. Her current projects include a second book, Underclass, which seeks to lyrically deconstruct the accepted narratives around poverty and class. She's currently an assistant professor at Bryn Mawr College where she directs the creative writing program. She lives here in Philadelphia with her husband and four children. So just a, a brief word about my experience reading Simulacra. Um, in an essay titled Other from Noun to Verb, poet and theorist Nathaniel Mackey observes, quote, artistic othering has to do with innovation, invention and change upon which cultural health and diversity depend and thrive. Mackey distinguishes artistic othering from social othering, which he says, quote, has to do with power, exclusion, and privilege, the centralizing of the norm against which otherwise otherness is measured, meted out, marginalized. Mackey's essay and my experience reading Simulacra um, made me think about artistic othering because throughout the collection, I felt as if I'd entered into a space in which nouns and conventional forms of subjectivity were under constant pressure, subjected to a force which bent and torqued language till I was caught up in a swiftly moving current that sought to worry in the blue sense, the fundamental struggle between states of being and acts of doing. I share Carl Phillips' sense that Simulacra endeavors to interrogate the cosmology of want and that that cosmology is juxtaposed against the notion of the rebel. But what distinguishes this collection of poems makes me understand it as a singular achievement on so many levels, thematically, formally, and theoretically, is its rejection of the notion that rebellion can be understood as noun, as a static positioning in opposition to. Looking at poems like On Meeting Want for the First Time, or the adjacent poem, The Good Dennis Wife, or The Mine Owner's Wife, we find Era D. Matthews insisting that oppositionality finds its clearest expression through motion, whether it be the ephemerality of the text or the tweet or through poems which abandon the conventions of subject and predicate. For example, in If My Late Grandmother Was Gertrude Stein, in favor of wordplay that mimics both the Freudian slip and the improvisatory rebellion of free jazz. In short, reading this collection was sheer delight. To read Era D. Matthews' poems is to gain a new understanding of Seamus Haney's wonderful phrase, the pure, clear air of verb, which returns us to Mackey's insistence that it is only through acts of artistic othering that the human community can eschew the delusional posturing associated with status seeking and social climbing in favor of the cultural health that comes when we wake up when we take up residence in ongoing leaps of faith. Please join me in welcoming to the University of Pennsylvania, 
arid demands. Thank you so much, Herman, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm happy to finally be here. I mean, this visit was in the works last year, but alas, all of our lives changed and continue to change. But here we are now, and it's my sheer delight. Um, I get the opportunity to sneak on campus every now and again to visit my son, who's a sophomore, and I throw raw vegetables out of the car window to make sure he's eating, but I haven't been on campus in any real substantial way since my undergrad days. Unfortunately, I never had you, Professor Beavers, because I was afraid of English classes. Um, I'm afraid, I was afraid they'd be reading books I'd never heard of or having conversations about those books I could not dare enter. Um, but I could do math, and so I became an econ student and hoped to get a job with Goldman Sachs and maybe later on bathe in stacks of money. Since, since none of that materialized, I am now a professor teaching English and creative writing. So that's my way of bucking the system in that I bucked myself. And I've been thinking a lot actually lately about um, the theme of tonight's reading, um, Brave Testimony. And thinking of the best way to lend a voice in a hall of many voices of African and African-American writers, I mean, when we lend our voices and our experiences, we resist that unbearable sameness of being. We resist essentializing our own identities. It's at that moment that possibility and inclusion enter at the behest of innovative thought. And in this way, to me, poems and identity are free to become something more than, was pre than what was previously assumed. And I'm really interested in my work in pressing against that that pressure point and understanding how poems and identity feed into each other. My second book with its constantly changing title is a series of extracted palimpsests or overwritten texts, which are layered sections of Adam Smith, the 18th century moral philosopher and economist, also the author of The Wealth of Nations, um, which was his magnum opus. So I took Smith's Wealth of Nations and made calculated extractions or what some people may call erasures as a symbol of late stage capitalism. Those extractions are my interpreted meaning of the text based on my lived experiences, which would indicate the failure of Smith's ultimate belief system, which was that the invisible hand exists or that the high tide lifts all boats. Uh, from my perspective, which includes coming from a very working class family that suffered grave bouts of domestic violence and trauma owing to my father's chronic unemployment and heroin addiction, um, there are some real people in the world without oars, without boats, who don't live near water, who've never even seen water. And so I hope in this new work interspersed with some poems from Simulacra, I might draw a faint thread between the theories that influence people's lives and the reality of those lives. Um, since I don't typically banter between poems because I like to lay the groundwork of the argument of the work, uh, without interrupting it too much. I will occasionally, though, interrupt myself for this reading for the sake of contextualization. So all that said, hey, Penn, hey, Penn community. I wrote some poems about various conditions of brokenness, fullness, blackness, capitalism. Want to hear them? You have no choice. <laughs> you can hang up, actually. You don't have to. But thanks for being here. Here they go. Eviction. For Vishlawa Zimborska. Unlike Lot's wife, my curse was built different. I could look back without threat of turning, and that's when I saw the others. Throngs of beings exiled too. Here, we thought ourselves alone. They screeched and fussed like fallen angels, pointing and calling me out of my name, as if I created this pyramid scheme of mere exist. I reached for the only man I thought alive and asked, was love ever honest, Adam? Was this garden ever ours? Were there always others? He didn't answer. His mouth hung agape, his eyes fixed to whatever yoke poured from me, amending the soil muddy where I stood. As a burning vine kindled against his arm, the stairs to heaven crumbled blister by blister at my feet. And just then, I knew what pang meant, what hunger felt like, and no matter how much, it would never be enough. It's too countless to name the number of any things I would not bless to be a salt pillar then and thereafter. To have my startle buried deep beneath a witness I can't share because I have no body 
that remembers, no body that remains. Heron. I thought it was a bird. Skimmed rush, hushed as before a fowl fixes its head up from shadow water, sickened by its own nature. Narcissist reversed. Unfed fortunate predatory consequence, the luck. Heron spots two ducklings resting on an outcrop of rocks. Swift-like, Heron bounces off the lake, a hollowed pebble. In one swallow, babes go down. Pulsing inside Heron's throat until they succumb. Mama Mallard squawks and plods, helpless. She flies low away. How long do mother ducks mourn? Until the next day? Next month, until pitch pines shake barren or a naked beggar shakes on his kitchen floor like Brescia in a rain stick begging two bird bags, four quarters, one gram. His daughters, empty cupboards, offer open tin at his feet, eat, eat until Heron comes. When sick, foul fit in veins like ducks in necks, vortex of sorts, some knew this. Yet none bothered to explain how Heron made him fly, why Heron made him, well, less starved. Ars Poetica, 1979. Digging in dregs of trash to find the bird my father needed to get well, I tore a vanishing line across the length of my palm. My hand emerged slowly, crown of pulp pulsing. My excommunicated ex-Navy father, come here boy. He called me boy, though I was a girl because he wanted a boy and I was a girl. He pressed his blackened finger into the head of the valley then dispensed some trauma he picked up in Vietnam about dead bodies not being able to bleed and pain being the only true way to know you alive. How pleasure persuades belief in a heaven that doesn't exist for people like us and how he could prove God was fiction and Satan the realest motherfucker ever made. Look around. He lifted his index finger, the one staunching the flow to his lip, sampled my blood. I let out something more moan than cry, too shocked for much else. When he grabbed the back of my neck, pulled me close to teach his only lesson worth remembering. Cry, boy. Look that honest wound in the eye, and you better let this bitch ass world see what he did to you. Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, Inherited Divide. This division is not of any wisdom. It is the necessary consequence of a certain human propensity to exchange one for another. Common to all men and animals, this contract, accidental. We cannot imagine but everyone is fond of being his father. Severance. 200 years after Franklin signed the Declaration of Independence, Amtrak purchased the crumbling stone viaducts and decrepit bridges between Boston and Washington. In five years, the federal government would surface 245 miles of track lay 171,000 tiles, renew 2,868 joints, interlock 5,800 switch timbers and order 492 Amfleet cars, including 16 sleek Metro liners, like one of two housed at Trenton Rail Station, where the authorities found my father in a stuporous nod while on the official clock. Having decided their three offers of rehab enough, Amtrak severed all contractual encumbrances. It was 1977 when my father stumbled from that station into a recession, but first into Pete Lorenzo's bar to unfold the holy ticks of time, then plot how to eat three square times four and who to feed to whom. Legacy. And then there are those who, in the words of artist Mendel Black, inherit rebellion. 
large lots of unbeing passed down generation to the next. Absent value on the free market, nothing gets resolved. Too many other worries anyhow, the who, what, when, where of basic living. Simple names are expensive. It costs too much to be pronounced. Best yet to curl under the weight of obscurity. Put on the full armor of mundane gods who see fit to have their heirs waste away among brothers fattened from lamb. Camelot. One summer he came back to my mother's mother's house, missing a finger. He and my grandmother drank Old Crow for hours, swiveled in the torn white vinyl seats in her kitchen, forearms draping the edge of her glass topped table. I'd asked what happened, eyeing the empty near his pinky. He said, walking the tracks, a corridor transit train ran over his hand. He was able to pull back mostly, all except for the ring finger, which sat under a rail in McTutchen. My grandmother leaned in, offered, fuck it, Sonny. You holding that glass like a man ain't lost a damn thing. They laughed like royals, like royals with subjects, heads thrown back. As he turned to the side, he asked me if I had a bike. Said he saw some kids on Stuyvesant Ave riding badass 10 speed huffies, I declined. He offered, never say no to what you don't pay for. Told me to expect one like those other kids on Christmas. His eyes seemed clouded though, squinty. He kept blotting his forehead with a paper napkin. The hand with one finger gone missing kept scratching, tugging at his face, his arms, his legs, where my grandmother's cat, Camelot, rubbed against my father's hems, revealing two mismatched socks, one white with blood seeping through the ankle, the other brown and unclean. Adam Smith, the wealth of nations, real cost. The real price of everything was paid not by gold or silver. What everything really costs is the trouble of acquiring it. Everything is bought with toil. Your body was the first price. 9 a.m. working class bedtime story. Every morning, two hours after the gate closed on her night shift, a woman in a gown wiped oil from ladder rungs, sharpened two hatchets with a dull wet stone and steadily climbed through troposphere to reach the ridge of her roof. Position just so, legs kennebo, arms dual wielding. She'd cut the sun from its cosmic string, watch it gyrate in midair. Light, don't down, nowhere easy. Taken swing after swing until the ax head flew and sun dimmed and fell through that roof onto a parlor floor where that woman collapsed, sheerly done in, while her curious youngin with my feral stare sat silent in the dark corner chair picking flint flakes of ash from her nappy ass hair. The mine owner's wife. The bone china had been laid out. The napkins threadbare, antiqued, yellowing. One gold rimmed plate with butter in the trench. The wife asked, how was your day? His coal mine mouth shaft widened to make an utterance, managed only soot and one canary. Canaries' wings blackened and broken, tangled in the web above their heads, suspended in the chandelier's pendulog. A spider-eyed dinner sharpened its knife claw. The mine owner dragged his fork's sharpened tine against his lip, rent his tongue. He bled all over the napkin, made pink the butter dish. His wife handed him her goblet. He wrung his tongue over her glass, spilled garnet into her bowl, filled his flute. They toasted, and this every single night. I'm gonna give a little bit of context for this one. This small short poem is called Clotilda. Clotilda was um, in July, 1860, an illegal slave ship carried 110 enslaved Africans to Mobile, Alabama and was scuttled. It was discovered in May, 2019 
It's interesting to note 1860 was the time that the slave ship was in use, and that is some 53 years after the act prohibiting the importation of slaves. Clotilda. There's a first time for everything. So we opened our mouths and manacled slaves of, I'm fine, disembarked the gangplank. Under glint of sun, the irons weakened and truth broke. Unshod hands cupped a fact of new earth and our bodies breathed out. No, no, actually we not okay. We always deserve better than this clay. Kafka-esque. The real hero in the metamorphosis was Greta, Gregor's sister. She found a way to avoid the snares. Who wants to deliver spoiled milk to a roach every morning? I mean, right now, there's a mouse in my kitchen. I've set down arsenic, but he's too wise. Whatever he wants, he'll find substitutes. He can wait for his French revolution, the guillotine tomorrow. Or maybe there's enough to form a union, or maybe they figured when Jimmy Hoffa didn't come back, they didn't want no smoke. You see, I'm the FBI to Stuart Little's mafia. They know when I'm trying to frame them, they slink around those traps, find cheese laughable. They get thick on Kool-Aid crystals sunken into the grout, like what's sweet better than savory. They know what they want. Smarter than me, see, my desires fleet, but I'll Pavlov dog it every time. Ring the bell, give me a shock. Ring the bell, give me a scrap. Ring the bell, I'll stink bug it. We'll climb the same wall to find the same swat, crushed by habit. But let's not get into the mechanics of what's slowly killing me in America. Today, I'm trying to murk these bastards, and they at least know not to fall for the same trap twice. Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, Origin and Use. Every man becomes a certain commodity, the former, the butcher, the brewer, the baker, the bread. Logical disjunction. Either the queen is dead or she crowns your hand. Either your fathers were kings or they died homeless paupers. Either your mother is a nigga nigga or she's a half white nigga. Either race is a genetic experiment or it's a ransacked section eight. Either humans use their claws or humans are mauled. Either history stutters or history was born mute. Either paradise is a congress of holes or hell's rivers have no mouths. Either someone holds a mirror or someone else has no reflection. Either they means all of them there or we means all of us here. Either this is a free country or this dream is wildly overpriced. Either hoard is fear misspelled or lack is hoard synonym. Either broke men leave nothing or nothing breaks death's weight. Either you wail enough into space and it is empty breath inside an urn or it is hurricane to dust. We was kings. Been trying to show you history don't change much. There's hard proof erasure repeats. What we learn to accept are tidy myths full of men who look unlike me, still people, but not me or my uncle who would share stories about a line of black kings in Scotland. How in 948, Dub the Black, son of Malcolm, was called vehement nigga. Dub was off in the field by his cousin Colin next in line. How Cuz was off by Dub's brother, Kenneth, who looked a lot like Obama if Obama lived in Kirk County in the late 900s. Even then, brothers wilded out in a country that found it suitable to call their kings niggas. This went on until every mud tongue fisher of sweet bone bread ground to chalk. Until the new kings with lighter eyes and narrow features commissioned portraits in which every past heir had a porcelain face. Only the backgrounds had any dark. 
all those kings who looked like me, waiting as muted novas in a celestial sea of utter blankness. Unsown. There comes a time in every farmer's life when he stoops low under the fever bake to survey his yield or lack thereof. He pushes back his cap, cups a palm full of earth. With the other hand, he fingers tiny granules, platy silt. In the veins beneath the leaf of this gesture, he knows if bloom or blight will follow. He knows when nothing good will grow and turns his back to the dead field, eyeing that small house, sitting on a tract of fallow, the smell of rye wafting, beloved waiting at their patinaed door. Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, on the division of labor. After she died, her lips moved as if praying. It takes several seconds for the brain to know it is no longer needed. Fridays outside the unemployment office, unobserved bodies revolved in and out of the doors. She left with the same paper she came, saying the same words. No work this week. Come back next week for American Arubarus. This is a contrapuntal, so it's one of those po poems that is three poems in one. Very American, very commercial, <laughs> very musical. My circle unsettles to write about being an imaginary, a mandala gone wrong, not a flag draped snake, an absurd spectacle watching an infinite idea unraveling. But nobody speaks of a slithering country driven to madness. This explains how wildfires start with a poor man begging for holy heat while his cruel lover strikes a match. And it's nothing new now, is it? Supposed to be that other symbol consuming its own tail? All these souls worship a misconstrued myth recoiling as the American way, wheeled by cognitive error and one burning rhetorical question. America, how do we keep warm? in a room swiftly filling with gas. My circle unsettles and it's nothing new to write about now, is it? Being an imaginary, supposed to be a mandala gone wrong, that other symbol, not a flag draped snake consuming its own tail, an absurd spectacle watching all these souls worship an infinite idea unraveling, a misconstrued myth recoiling. But nobody speaks of a slithering as the American way country driven to madness, wheeled by cognitive error. And this explains how wildfires start with one burning rhetorical question, a poor man begging for holy heat, America, how do we keep warm? While his cruel lover strikes a match in a room swiftly filling with gas. Head on swivel, son. Sunlight barges through our windows, lands across my cheek as forceful as a slap. I place my morning news down, sorrowed by some other mother's loss. Some other mother's loves will not return home the way they left. Wrong place, wrong time, wrong color, wrong body, as if any of those things signify. I tell my sons the problem with time is that every clock cries wolf, which is not to say every moment doesn't mean. What matters is knowing the difference between a wink and a blink, what harms and what suggests harm, a variance measured in milliseconds. Knowing too, if at any given instant, you are seen through the smudge lens of pale whim as object or armament, fantasy or flesh to be torn asunder. This is a quarantine poem uh, because I don't know if anybody else has felt like they have been losing it in, during quarantine, but I have. So here we are. To tell you three things on my mind is to tell you about quarantine and temperance. How we lose ourselves in infinite scroll, 
Lost lifetimes because noon is conceptual, no rhythms. Loss is why casinos have no clocks and windows. Time's never up in isolation. Did you know whale speak sounds like a monastic chant and a morning song? And if whales are mourning, who sues them? Certainly not the lantern nymphs. They're busy eating fruit trees, grapevines. And who will ready Jesus's wine on the altar come Armageddon? Bar has been closed for a year. Won't nobody be forgiven in a dry land. Sober sinners, the lot of us, including the other beings who act a fool during apocalypse. Rhinos run up and down their devegetated plain. Laminated ferns and extruded wood waste inside zoo pens next to the hippos who are trying to unsuccessfully drown themselves. They too thick skinned, too effective at float, too able to survive. But the four horsemen surely come as soon as they wrangle the sick wheat water. Any moment now, you'll see God waiting to unleash. She, he, they waiting, waiting on the one animal to do one more goddamn thing to some animal who has had it up to waiting. A complete stranger asked me to sound less urgent. Calm down so you don't come off unhinged. Waiting, a white lady poet says, good you have four kids, you can spare one. Waiting, I can't spare one. Waiting, I have none to spare. Waiting, I'm cash poor when it comes to birth. The hand in my pocket is full of seven trumpets and I'm waiting like a time bomb on a wombless sill. Etymology. Because my mother named me after a child born still to a godmother I've never met, I took another way to be known, something easier to remember, inevitable to forget, something that rolls over the surface of thrush. Because I grew tired of saying no is pronounced. Now I'm tired of not conjuring that ghost I honor. Say it with me, era. Rhymes with Sarah. Sarah from the Latin meaning a woman of high rank, which also means whenever I ask anyone to hold me in their mouth, I sound like what I almost am. Hear me out. I'm not a D or a river charging through working class towns where union folk cog wedge for plots and barely any house at all, where bosses mangle ethnic phonemes and nobody says one word because checks in the mail. So let's end this classes pretend where names don't matter and language is too heavy a lift. My E is silent, like most people should be. The consonant is sonorant, is a black woman, or one might say the spine. I translate to wind in a country known for its iron. Imply lioness of God in Jesus's tongue mean apex predator free of known enemy, fierce enough to harm or fast enough to run. From here on out, this singular truth. The tongue has no wings to flee what syllables it fears. The mouth is no womb, has no right to consume what it did not make. Sims irony. In this game, they're woke. They oppose GMOs and don't know why eat vegan and buy luxury thrift, fit into bikinis, jeans, love whoever they want and ghost whoever they don't, act brand new whenever they act, always act. Take copious selfies to recall what they look like through a filter in a visually fortuitous moment. Say, wait, let me video this present suffering. Make followers envy how plastic they're bending full on their fake. First tooth babies they birthed or borrowed because cute gets likes and likes get stands. These vote incapable tickets, pay taxes or don't, drive electric or synthetic, tattoo fill thoughts, foe over friends, double ends this or that, flip, flop, hard knuckle dead ends, attend rallies, abolish the hood, then change the name to corridor. Tar and feather nuance, execute truth on the wheel, town square their public beheadings. All this while cramped in the smallest cell of their warden's carceral imagining. So this next poem I am absolutely going to contextualize because I don't want it to be um, taken out of context. Uh, part of the thesis of the book is about the ways in which capitalism commodifies blackness. Um, Blackness sells, we make culture. On making an essential nigga for the gatekeepers. 
Take at least two of any of these niggas. Niggas ain't got shit, nigga. Think they ain't shit, nigga. Hands down the pants, nigga. Circle jerk eye jizz, nigga. Jeans slung low, nigga. Tommy Hilfiger, nigga. Look at this label, nigga. Pop this collar, nigga. Bespoke ass, nigga. Pull that resume, nigga. Crude up ass, nigga. Ain't no nigga hot as me, nigga. What you know about that, nigga? Rent a center subsidized, nigga. No house, no equity, nigga. Fuck boy, I love pussy, nigga. Just the tip, nigga. Bitch mine now, nigga. Ham hock pot licking, nigga. Black lacquer bedroom, nigga. Grease that scalp, nigga. Velvet wallpaper, nigga. Don't talk about my mama, nigga. Ain't I a pretty nigga? Wave cap boar brush, nigga. They invited and I went, nigga. Sucking pink nipples, nick, nigga. Riding peach dick, nigga. White ice best cold, nigga. Michelle Pfeiffer ass, nigga. White savior save us, sinner, nigga. Massa show good to me, nigga. Milk and toke, milk toast, nigga. Look at my fat pockets, nigga. Weren't supposed to be nothing, nigga. They made me great, nigga. On the map, nigga. Can't read maps, nigga. GPS work just fine, nigga. Follow it to the grave, nigga. They buying you out, nigga. 30 in a crown now, nigga. Captain Sunk can't swim, nigga. Don't make no waves, nigga. Sharks worse than whips, nigga. Cotton gin boom, nigga. Wait for the gavel, nigga. Going once, going twice, nigga. Sold to the highest bidder, nigga. They don't even like you, nigga. Much less need you, nigga. Ampersand and asterisk, nigga. More where you came from, nigga. Spade hoe and dibber, nigga. It's never about you, nigga. About what you signal, nigga. Green, not black, nigga. White hot spotlight, nigga. Look at the parade, nigga. Helium strings in my line, mylar, nigga. Lip sync platform, nigga. They love niggas like you, nigga. Floats and music, nigga. Cheer and Colt 45, nigga. Free promo ass niggas, please, sir. Call me nigger, nigga. That's how they like their niggas. Hands where they can see a nigga. So box built by other niggas, nigga. Standing on a trap door, nigga. If not me, then who, nigga? Somebody gotta get it, nigga. Now you see me, nigga. Now you don't, nigga. Magical glitter, nigga. What's your name, nigga? Should I know you, nigga? Ain't you the other nigga, nigga? You look like the other nigga, nigga. Don't nobody know you, nigga. They revision history, nigga. Nobody told you, nigga. Use a writ page, nigga. Use a footnote, nigga. Use an if then, nigga. If that, nigga. If that. parochial word problem for the apocalypse. Thank you guys. <laughs> I'm looking at the chat. Thank you. It's, it's live over there. I appreciate y'all. If the days pass as others before and time stills near black holes horizons and all born to a trumpeter tweeting about cow tipping in Ireland and aliens exist at 3 p.m. but use a midnight god shield so you can't see them. And someone on a hilltop has a ruinous cry surrounded by a salt of locusts. And if due north, barefoot titans die at the sorry edge of regret and perhaps having said penance, a shadow unruches and winnows sorrow infinitely and pilgrims brood and broods thresh and summer is the opposite of swelter and iced coffee undulates in a bra cup and two parts dust to one part luster picks up right nice and gussied up dubs are sold higher than peace costs and mercy goes to my forearm with a touch when it feels like it and soul sick is just longing and drag and all who sleep aren't well or dry and for two pennies more a half-coated avatar will suck dry your salt water bread tease a, a left nipple with a rat tail comb and aren't you excited now and don't you want it and don't you want this catastrophe to come harder and inside of you and if so what time will little Noah thread a camel through a needle and make it rain. Elegy for the mourner. After 25 years accumulating dust, it's time to remove the urn from the curio and put him beneath proper ground. There's a small problem of not having a pine box for the body made smaller by not having the body at all. Hell, I don't have a choir to sing riffs and not one pastor to eulogize. I abandoned feathered hats and black church theatrics to settle on myrrh kindling and anonymous petitions, but I concede burials should at minimum be an occasional final rites, pomp and happenstance, if you will, with at least one moaner who may or may not know the departed. And so I gather alone with a shovel in my backyard and his needle in my forethought. I offer what I have to give these brick pavers, the memory of my sister's insistent fist through our locked front door and the gentle way he sobered to wrap her paw in an old t-shirt. The Wonder Woman lunch pail in which he disoriented caught the rabbit bat that bit me while I slept. It was a spell that bite it took. Days later, we discovered an imprisoned bird instead of the bat. The bird lived, I lived, we all lived for a while, at least until we didn't. I'm now miles from where he spoke his last words. I meant to call and kept forgetting. I believed him. When the reaper whispers soon come, men tend not to lie. 
Plus the chaff was high for 17 summers. Somebody had to harvest and shoot it up. Somebody had to do their one job well. He couldn't have known the crossroads stranger was Lucifer, the barter larcenous, and I despised his ignorance. Entertained the question once and again, what good father doesn't know what's on sale at that intersection? Thankfully, hindsight mellows and steadfast spite proves a futile flex because no matter how hard I earnestly hoped, my rage never once raised my father from any of his graves. His eye on the arrow after Hanif. I guess black people can write about flowers at a time like this since every poem turns on itself, starts one way to end another. We see it in nature too. How seed turns to leaf regardless of its earth or the thought inside my head blossoms into a hyacinth with as sweet a scent. Like how in dreams, thoughts play cousin, I see Mamie Till often. She walks the aisle toward her son's body while wisteria bloats the casket's brim and papered bougainvillea tracks emerge from where his eye once was. An entire garden from the nutrients of human soil and not to mention all those awed birds that circle Emmett's pillowed corpse. So many in the tabernacle, not harbingers of his God's descent, not refugees fleeing his body exilic, but ecstasy's messengers. We living have death all wrong. Where eternity is concerned, we live in. Um, for time's sake, I'm going to do one more poem. This is a poem that started as a Facebook um, status message some many years ago uh, when I was reading Gertrude Stein's Tender Buttons. And I thought about how um, she was somewhat contemporary with my grandmother and how privilege really played into being able to be avant-garde and being able to be on the cutting edge. I mean, privilege plays into that. There's no doubt about it in my mind. And so I tried to contextualize Gertrude Stein's syntax inside of my grandmother's mouth, who spoke very similarly because she uh, spoke with African American vernacular. She was from Pike County, Alabama. And so um, I played pretend to see what would happen. Some context here my grandfather is from Sicily, Italy. My mother is half white, and she is the product of an affair. One, Southern migration. Leech, broke speech, leaf ain't pruning pot. Lay, lie, lie, hair, straight off. Arrowed branch and horse joint, elbow ash, row fish, row dog, slow milk pig, blue water sister, hogs like willow. Weep crow, weep cow, so bug, so narrow, inchway, inches away, over the bridge, back that way, fur, fur needles and coal. Black hole, black out, black feet, blame. Long way, still. Not there, there, here, same. Two, feed the soul. Old crow, liquor, drink, drunk, girdle, grits, grit, tea, grit, tea, tea, get, get shaved, shook, shucked, shit, flower, flower, lard, and swallow, hard edge, chew, chip, tooth, bite, tool, chip, bite, bloat. Bloat, bloat, blight, seat, blight, sit, tea, be light, city, downtown, dim, slight, dark, old, arc, new, arc, new, arc, new, work, nork. Lark fed, corn bread, bed feather back, Sunday shack, church fat, grease glove, dust rub, love, cheap heeled shoes, window seat, mirror eye, window eye, window, window, when though, when though, wind blow? November, December, no cinder, no slumber, no summer, branch, branched, blanched, fried, freed, fly, want, what, want, what, want, what, graves want. Three, miscegenation. Good, smooth, curly haired baby, baby, rock a by my baby, mama, rock a by her baby. Wrestle the earth, baby, no dirt, no dirt, shine, shine. Shine neck porcelain, tin, tarnish, powder milk, pout her milk, powder silk inheritance, front the wash tub, top the bed, bin, leaky numbers run in, run in, run on, red fever holds your palm, sweat it out, hot, hot, heat the rest, pretty melt that wax wide flower, Ellis Island daddy, oh, daddy's bar, band, mongrel hum, come, Come now, little bones bend, old crack, creak, crank, crick, curly cue, fuck them, then fuck them. You hear me? 
walk through good hair, baby. Half of you belong on Gertrude Stein, four. Who? Bills Mount Picasso, who? Matisse, who? Mortgage, no currency canvas, pay brushes, stroke, stroke, bridge, brittle, blend, 10 miles, day break, 10 miles, they break, we broke. No widgets in the envelope, no railroad green, agriculture, peace snap, earth under nail, spine and stilt woman, roach kill, heal woman, roaches in the crawl woman, creep, keep fifth grade everywhere, wear everywhere, we're everywhere, anyhow, we sacrifice and hammer, they sacrifice the hammer, never, axe and hatchet make callous, hard hand, prison pen privilege, prison privilege pin, bar thorn pin, pine cross crown, wait, 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 iron is harder. Chicken fat can is full of spark. Spark kill or spark coal or spark cull. Spark cull, ho, heave, ho, heave. Holy, heavy, heavy, heavy. Life's genius. That is that, Gertrude. Who? Thank you so much for listening. Wow, what an incredible reading. Um, I am going to ask for the sake of efficiency that um, we have about 12 minutes for questions. Um, uh, if you have questions, please put them in the, the Q&A and then I will relay them to Professor Matthews. Um, uh, so I'm looking now. And there are no questions, but um, that's okay because I have a question. Um, so I I really do see the um, relationship in your work between um, uh, language, the language of poetry, and the and the the, the language of, of free jazz and. I think the best way that I can describe it, particularly listening to the poems in this reading, um, you're like the you're like the lonious monk who doesn't resolve the chord. Yes. That's um, and your, your poems your poems Thank end you. on the upbeat. <laughs> um, and I'm I'm just struck by that because I remember having this conversation with Yusef Komenyaka where he said, "Too many poets write past the ending." Mm -hmm. And your poems never seem to do that. So, so um, I, I just like to hear you talk a little bit about how you determine where to end a poem because your poems don't end at the expected places. They end at a place where you leave us wanting. So, I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, I think um, I think a lot of my intuition around where to end a poem comes in that. I, I love brief poems. I really do. I've always loved a poem in its brevity that I can go back to and try and dissect and figure things out. And I don't want to ever get my reader in a place where um, I'm leading them too far off course. Um, and so I tend to, and also the other thing is I almost always have an ending in mind before I have a beginning. And I don't know why that is. Um, it's just the way that my mind works. And so uh, I think with that in mind, one of the ways in which uh, I end a poem is, you know, sometimes it is abrupt. And a lot of that just has to do with me feeling like that's it. That's all this poem wants to give me. And that's all the poem is going to give you. And so we just deal with it. And uh, um, I'm okay with it. You know, it's like, it's just one of those things where I, I agree with Yusef. Like, I don't ever want to write past the ending of a poem, right? And so sometimes I might, in order not to do that, I might end a poem early, earlier mm -hmm. than one would have. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that is because I'm really interested in the space that happens after the poem is finished. What happens with the reader? What happens with the listener? What happens with, if it's a visual poem, the viewer um, after the poem has concluded? Um, and it's just kind of a private experience. And I want to give my readers a private experience after a poem ends, um, a period of contemplation and meditation, if you will, um, to think about what 
may have happened, what just happened. Yeah. To contemplate and to, to Thank comment. you for that. that. That's a really rich answer. Um, we have a question. Um, uh, how and when did you get over the fear? Uh, this question is from Brian Peterson. Uh, how and when did you get over the fear of English that you described in your intro? And he adds, very glad you did, by the way. Thanks, Brian. Brian and I were at school together, so we go way back. Um, you know, I think it was, uh, it's funny, I did take one English class at Penn. I tried to take one English class. I went to the first class and they did exactly what I thought what would happen is that they all started talking about a book that I had no context. I did not read the book. I didn't know anything about the book. So I just was like, okay, econ it is. And so I just moved over. But <laughs> what it was for me was just developing a reading life. I didn't grow up with a bunch of books in my home. Mm -hmm. And so it, for me, I did have to develop that muscle, like to love reading. And I love reading and unfortunately collect more books than I can possibly read at any, at any given time. But um it's just something I had to learn to love. And I realized that it's um, a way to, it, for me, it was like a form of escapism. Um, math is really concrete mm -hmm. for the most part, you know, I mean, there's some conceptual math for sure, but for me, it just felt like um, I was able to do that. And I didn't feel confident when I was in undergrad that I could really do that, that I could think more deeply about a text and start to compare them. But I began to realize that you can, um, you can analyze a text in the same way that you can analyze a problem, mm -hmm. you know? And um, there's some beauty in that. And so I was compelled in that in my later years. And it just came, uh, I, I started reading Morrison when I was, um, I think when I was in undergrad, like toward the end of my undergraduate years, I started reading Morrison and then my sister, turned me on to J. California Cooper. And then I just kind of started reading everything that I could possibly, everything from every walk of life that I could possibly read, including philosophy and psychology and sociology and science. Um, I just wanted it all. I just became an autodidact. I was hungry for what I was missing. And I, I had a, a, an insecurity issue. And that was why I didn't go into English. It was really about insecurity. I just overcame it over time and started to realize that I can think through those problems of, of text in the same way you think through a math problem. Well, I share that sense. I, I took an English class my freshman, my freshman year and it was all um, English and, and white American poets and I never came back. And so I was back at my school to, to talk and I said, y'all must think I'm crazy. I'm an English professor who didn't major in English. Um, so I, I share that I share that that sense. Um, we have a, a a second question from Ashabi, who writes. I would say that imagery and issues sing and supply you with words. The theme, succinctly put, I enjoy your style. And she has a second question: Do you edit continuously? Do you ever come back and change a finished work? Always. And thank you for those questions. That's a great question. Always. I. There was just a thread on uh, Twitter, I think, on Poetry Twitter, where we were talking about this. It's just, I am constantly editing. I actually just had something published just this past week, and I, I got the journal in the mail, and I took red ink to the journal. It was my poem, but I took red ink to it. I was like, ah, I should have did this. I could have did that. I could, you know, and so you start thinking about it, because it's really, it, it truly is one of those situations where you just abandon a work. It's not so much that it's done. Right. And I think for me, what I had to get to is the point of recognizing, okay, Here's when I know that I'm done with a poem. Do I feel satisfied with the poem? Or am I looking for, am I looking for satisfaction or perfection? If I'm looking for perfection, it is not a realistic goal. If I'm looking for satisfaction, yes, I can leave a poem and feel satisfied and feel that I gave everything that I knew to give in the poem and the poem is giving what it needs to give to the reader um, or hoping that, that it does that. But I mean, it's a constant thing for me. I mean, I, I, I can literally go back to Simulacra and still edit that if I wanted to. Like I could do a Walt Whitman and just do a Leaves of Grass on it and just be editing it forever. But it's just at this point, I feel like I've moved past those poems. So I've abandoned them. So I just let it go. It's an it's a, it's, it's a interesting um, exercise in letting go. 
yeah, I'm I'm somebody that that um, I just yeah I just walk away because because I, I I have a poem that I have every time I read it I want to change the ending. Right, right, exactly right. Just like I should just leave it alone. Just gonna leave it alone. Yeah, I just turn I, I just turn the page. Do you sit on poems too? Like for a very I'm sorry. Long, do you do you sit on poems for a long? Oh time? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, my students are horrified when I tell them it took me 13 years to finish a poem. <laughs> Same. Um, you know, young people do not want to hear, they do not want to hear that. Um, because they're like, no, nah, uh, -uh it's, it's supposed to happen now. Not, right. not when I'm 46, it's supposed right. to happen when I'm 26. Right. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, I have another question from Philip Williams, who asks, can you speak to the relationship between your works and cantatory sound and nonsense as in speak in tongues so the devil don't understand. Do you see your work as spells coded for black life? Great question. I do. Thank you, Philip, for that question. I absolutely do. Um, I'm very into uh, the language of incantation and trying to understand it. It's actually one of the first experiences I had with poetry were incantations. And so uh, I think it pretty much influenced me in all of my work. It has become incantatory. It's like, um, it's, 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 it's trying to conjure something. Each poem I think of it as trying to conjure something or another, whether it's a feeling or it's a moment. And um, I, you know, I appreciate that language. I, what was the second half for Phil's question? He was talking about the incantatory language. Oh, is it coded? Yes, for yeah. black life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. And so a lot of my coding, has to do with the way that I learned language and processed language. So my grandmother was very influential in my life and um, she had a fifth grade education, you know? And so she used liberties with language and would say, I were instead of I was, and you know, just all kinds of these slippages inside of language, which seemed perfectly reasonable for me. Like I didn't judge that, it seemed reasonable. So I'm always constantly thinking about the ways in which language slips and how can you, um, how can you extract those slippages inside of a poem? How can you make the poem um, a place for that kind of language to live? So that's what I'm really interested in. It's also why um, I use parataxis quite a bit. I'm really interested in um, how to juxtapose um, the juxtaposition, the juxtapositions of, 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 of phrase and turns. And, mm -hmm. um, and quite frankly, although I, when I read Gertrude Stein, I really did not like Gertrude Stein. I, she's in my lineage. And mm -hmm. so a lot of how she was writing, which I actually think is owing to Ave which was not called Ave then, but which very much was an influence in her own work, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a part of me. And so I want to give rise, I want to give space for that, uh, for that language and not have it be an othered or a code switch, mm -hmm. you know, just let it be a part of my regular standard protocol. Okay, another question from Rachel Zolf, who asks, can you describe a bit more your palimpsestic process with Wealth of Nations? How yes. are you intervening in the text? We hear the textures of your voice in those poems so well. Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm taking um, I'm taking excerpts from the Wealth of Nations and pulling out. It's basically erasure, although I call it extraction. I'm pulling out um, key ideas, key thoughts, um, phrases, language that seems to resonate with me and speaks to my experience more than the original text does. And so then I layer the original text. The original text is underneath. I wish I could show you these poems, but the original text is underneath the extracted language. So the actual poem lays on top of the of Smith's original text. And many of the poems in the second book will be palimpsests, um, either some visual image or some text that's relating to the poem itself. I'm really leaning into that as a um, as a, as visual language, but also more importantly, as thinking about thinking about how um, the 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 genetic ties of language, how we're like we're tied to text, the intertextuality of it all. Like, how are we how are we thinking about language based on what we've read or what we understand? How are we thinking about language based on what we've lived? 
those are all really interesting questions to me and I try and take those on, but that's really the process for the palimpsest poems and they're not created in word. I have to use um, visual um, programs like Illustrator, some I've used Photoshop, but I'm learning InDesign now too, because I wanna move into far more visual poems um, where I'm taking economic graphs and using them as uh, a form of a poem. Wow. So thank you, Rachel, um, that's a great question. A uh, couple more questions. We got time for a couple more. Uh, Lenny Brown asks, I am always so amazed by your reading of your work. Can you talk about performance? Mm. Yeah. Um, it's, it's odd for me because I know that it is performance, but for me, it also just feels like somatic experience or expression. So I feel like um, language is in our bodies. Um, that's why, you know, you see people who talk with their bodies or people who, you know, who gesticulate wildly, or I'm really interested in the ways in which uh, our bodies send, our bodies are messengers as well as our words and our words are housed in our bodies. And so I'm always thinking about the ways in which the word come, becomes more alive through the body. It's um, almost like a limb, an extension of the words itself. Um, and I'm always trying to like really think about how does this feel in my body and being free with it, kind of being liberated in the way that I'm expressing a poem. Um, I, I, I don't know, I just, I, I question language when you don't feel it in your body. You know, it's like music. Sometimes you can listen to something and you're like, oh, you know, you just start, you start swaying. And as poets, we do that with words. Just like, yeah, okay, I can just, so I just use my body as a way to, as a, a further conveyance of the message inside of the poem. Um, and it can be taught, performance for sure can be taught. And I've been saying this for years, but I do think that poets should take acting classes. Um, just so you can read your work. <laughs> That's so funny that you say that because um, uh, I read uh, Stanislavski's uh, sort of his exercises for actors and I use those in my workshop. Yeah, yeah, that's right on. I'm um, a big fan of Michael Chekhov. And so it's um, Anton Chekhov's nephew, I believe. Um, and I just, I, I love using acting theory inside of the creative writing class. I actually think you get in better touch with images that way too. Yes, yes, I would agree. Okay, we have one more question. We have time for one more question. So Jonah Mixon Webster asks, can you please discuss the formal approaches concerns in this new work? Any formal approaches that helps to bridge the history of the rail system with your father's appearance at the train station? Or the, fa the father's appearance at the train station. Yeah. Um, so thank you for asking that, Joan. That's a great question. So um, one of the things I don't think I added before we started talking was I took a trip to the University of Edinburgh in uh, 2018, actually, uh, the summer of 2018, to study Adam Smith's archives and uh, amassed a bunch of texts and uh, research documents that are helping me to think through, OK, how was Smith thinking when he was thinking this? What, what were some of the kind of, what was the, the, the cultural context that helped him to create the wealth of nations? And it was, it was fascinating. So for me, research is fundamental. So yes, with the rail station, the history of the rail system, with my father's appearance at the station, I just did research on it because I wanted to better understand how did he become involved with Amtrak, how did Amtrak wound, wind up in Trenton, New Jersey, which is the city that I'm from? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what's the history behind it? There's a history behind everything. And I think trying to dig a little deeper into frameworks helps and researching helps you to create a richer, more robust poem. And so that's what I, I am always, always thinking about how can you get the background for anything that you're talking about? I may not use it in the poem, but just to know it for my own personal, um, you know, knowledge base is helpful. Um, so, you know, I don't know in terms of formal approach, but for me, research is fundamental um, and trying to be in the spaces where people were creating their theories, trying to understand um, the cultural context and the times which change all the time. We cannot 
properly contextualize an 18th century man right now. We can't, we don't understand all of the material, the materiality of the culture in which he lived. So we have to research that, we have to understand that. And I think when you can get to kind of the material aspects of times past, it does in fact make a poem richer, deeper, more thoughtful, um, engaging. Thank you, Jonah, for that question. Okay, well, I want to thank you. Um, this has been um, an absolutely incredible reading and I'm delighted that people are gonna be able to see the recording of the reading because um, uh, I was hoping, I, I, I made a comment in the chat. I was so glad that you read uh, the poem that you read. I heard it the first time at the Kalaloo. Oh. <laughs> um, I, I, I was gonna stop short of asking you to read it, but I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you read it. I put um, it at the last minute too, so I'm really glad, good. Um, <laughs> I wanna thank all of our, our, all of our guests for coming. Um, this has been, um, uh, we are so happy to be back to Brave Testimony after um, not being able to do it last year. Um, uh, and you'll be happy to know that Wes was in my class last oh, year. Oh, he told me that. Yes, he loved it. The Toni Morrison class. He told me yes, he loved he it. Yes, was, he, was, he was one of only two men in the class. <laughs> I, I can only think that that's your influence. Yes, on yes. Him. Yes, he, he loves literature, so he is always going to be, and Toni Morrison especially, um, and has great admiration for you. So he, you know, he, he jumped at the chance to be in your class. Well, see, somebody from the Matthews family ended up in my class. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. Um, and, you know, it just took a generation, that's, that's all. That's it, that's it, just one um, generation. Listen, please take care of yourself and be safe. And um, please come back to see us. At I would some love point to. Time. We would thank be delighted. Thank you for invitation. Truly. Thank, thank you. you so much. And thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. And thanks to Sean Fields for uh, his, his technical assistance. Thank you, Sean. Everybody take care. Good night.